Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, Rebonjour et welcome back to our conference on the digitization in Africa international power plays. Um, after having discussed in the first panel um, international digital infrastructure strategies and partnerships, um, and of course, we've also started to look into um, how these partnerships are uh, deployed locally and national nationally, um, we will now continue discussing um, also the local and national geopolitics of uh, digital infrastructure in specific countries and especially in um, urban contexts of the, con uh, the continent. So my name is Sina Schlimmer and I'm a researcher here at IFRI. Um, as Adi said, I am coordinating um, a research program dealing with uh, urban governance in Africa. I'm also very happy to partner up uh, for the first time for a conference with uh, Alice Penier and and, uh, the team of her program on geopolitics on, uh, of technology. Uh, thanks a lot for the whole team um, for putting this together. And uh, I think this collaboration makes a lot of sense in that it helps us to associate um, the question of uh, urban governance and the role of uh, uh, innovation and technology. So to give you a bit of context, Africa is the region with the highest um, urban growth rates in the world, and this urban growth has been de defined as a key development uh, issue, especially in 2015, when one of the sustainable development goals, uh, number 11, uh, more precisely, was dedicated to the creation of inclusive and so-called sustainable cities. Um, in the common narrative, one of the main challenges of urbanization in Africa and more broadly in the global south uh, is that um, these cities would be um, difficult to read and to regulate. Um, Africa's cities are often described as chaotic, jammed, unplanned, polluted and informal. And just to give you an idea, um, it has been uh, shown in several reports, including uh, the ones from UN Habitat, that uh, but more than 60% uh, of the urban population, of the urban working population, would be um, working in the so-called informal sector. So one of the remedies to these difficulties that um, public authorities encounter to um, regulate uh, this, this rapid urban growth would be innovation, um, which then would lie in techn technology and uh, digital infrastructure. Um, and Africa's potential for developing uh, innovative, smart, flexible and adaptive solutions, especially in urban economies, um, has been highlighted and picked up by uh, international organizations, by the private sector, but also by national governments in broader political and economic um, programs. So the idea here is to develop digital fit for purpose tools in various sectors such as banking, social security, health, transport, even land registration and political activities such as uh, voting, for example, um, that would then respond to the needs um, and realities and practices of local urban populations. Um, these are especially services that are accessible through mobile phones, um, which are widely used uh, over, over the continent. Um, so this idea of govern governing um, or governance by technology culminates in the idea also of building smart or uh, new cities that can even contribute to generating data, which in turn then would help to um, govern uh, fast growing cities. Um, Again, uh, digital infrastructure and urban areas are often described as a rather technical and development issue and not so much political, but I think what we will also highlight today in the different um, presentations and the discussions, I hope, is that it is a highly political and geopolitical topic. Um, geopolitical in the sense that multiple stakeholders, as, as we've already seen in the first panel, um, are involved in financing and also developing and implementing um, these di um, diverse types of infrastructures in smart cities and African countries. Um, so I'm looking forward um, to, to three presentations of this panel who will touch upon different aspects of this growing interest around 
um, digital infra uh, infrastructure in Africa cities. Um, yeah, and I'm enlightened uh, to introduce our first speaker, who is um, uh, Raymond Mendy. Um, very grateful for him to having traveled all the way from Kinshasa to Paris. He reached us this morning. Um, he is a Senegalese entrepreneur and business leader. He obtained a master's degree at the University of Paris Est Grete in administration. So welcome back to um, to the capital. And um, he also holds a, a certificate in international marketing from the Thunderbird School of Global management um what i'm very interested uh now is to hear um more about what you think raymond um about uh, this idea of the african continent and cities in particular uh as a field of entrepreneurship and um, as a field of innovation especially in the fintech industry from your experience um is the tech sector uh, really helping cities to become um, these famous engines uh, of of growth um, and how is this narrative picked up also by national urban policies? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, Sina, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm very pleased to be here. And I've been traveling uh, for the whole night just to reach Paris, a long trip. And uh, today I'm going to take the opportunity just to share with you the how African should be seen as an entrepreneurship and innovative lab. And uh, let's bear in mind that mobile has been a transformative, very transformative uh, means for our ecosystem or our economy. And we've seen in 1988 or 84, the first mobile network that has been developing uh, in DRC b before it started picking up in rest of Africa. And uh, we've seen the first network has been uh, built by Celtel at that time. And we've been talking about voice services, basically voice and SMS, and where we've seen also growing internet services and data. And, uh, and internet services, I can remember that time where we were just providing the age or GPRS services. Everybody was just very happy to have their BlackBerry and so on. But we've seen, we've uh, worked quite long from there. And uh, just to give a small feedback of my background, so I'm totalizing more than 20 years experience in telco. And uh, for the last five years, I've been just focusing on uh, digital transformation in Africa. This is how I'm supporting and to build and structure a uh, digital hub or tech hub. And uh, so far, what we've seen in uh, mobile connectivity knowing that uh, telco has been very supportive in today what we're talking about digital <clears throat> today we've seen uh, some quite impressive penetration of mobile in africa in some countries it's more than 100 percent and uh, in some others it's uh, below because also of the coverage challenges that uh, we do encounter in some countries because of distance because of also the the geography and uh, today when we look at the the mobile subscribers we it's quite important more than half of the population but if you look at the internet we still lag behind because of all the challenges that i will just present you so far on the infrastructure part but more like on also in uh, the solution and the services that we're providing. In that also point, uh, you have the uh, contribution of uh, how mobile uh, network is contributing in GDP. And uh, we've seen lately the uh, mobile money picking also coming to transform the entire ecosystem. And uh, some part that we should be looking very carefully is by the time we introduce data services 
and uh, the whole business changed in a way that uh, in uh, the beginning when we were only selling voice, only one person need to have some credit because we all know that uh, African market is a prepaid market. And uh, it's also changed the number of active customers because we were considering as an active customer those who were having credits, airtime, to, that are unable to make calls. But with data today, everybody should have at least a bundle, a data bundle, just to be able to connect with the rest of their peers. If I have to talk about the how mobile money has transformed, I would say fintech, and uh, we've been more talking about digital wallets because in some countries we're talking about mobile money, in some others it's uh, wallets, and uh, and I will be sharing with you some some uh, some insight of uh, markets where mobile money is not picking like in uh, Nigeria. And uh, the major mobile the wallet providers in Africa used to be uh, M-Pesa from Vodafone, Orange Money from Orange, of course, and MPN Momo from MPN, the African telco group. And uh, why Nigeria is uh, a mobile banking system is because the the banking sectors there, they protected their businesses. And this is how mobile money lately joined in the, the, uh, the financial ecosystem. And uh, this is how, if you look at mobile money penetration in uh, Nigeria is very low compared to the banking system. And we should also bear in mind that Banking penetration in, in Nigeria is higher than in, uh, yes, any other countries in, yes, in Africa. And uh, today, the, uh, the most, well, let's say, dynamic uh, mobile money market, financial market, are the East Africa and West Africa. Of course, West Africa supported by the population of Nigeria that we do have. But we all know that we have some small countries with some very dynamic players uh, doing that role. And uh, yes, in the previous panel, we talk about you know, how mobile money has transformed some of the ecosystem in Senegal, in Mali, where the population has embraced and adopted very well the, all the mobile money services. In the meantime, you will have in some other countries where mobile money is lagged behind, I could name DRC, where people are still struggling to, to adopt mobile money in general because it's more related also to some governance issues, governance, transparency, because uh, DRC by by itself is the only country in Africa that I've seen so far that has not integrated utilities bills in mobile money, where in any other country in Africa, we have already introduced you know, the electricity bill, the water bills, the TV broadcast. And those are the basic services that support you know, mobile money adoption, mobile money testing. Today, the challenges and opportunities that we're seeing in general in most of African market is related to the infrastructures that uh, we talked about previously, the human capital, the eagles. Why eagles? Because the first, uh, the first customer of digitalization is government, and so far in in. Uh, in most of our francophone countries, uh, government are, you know, they are very shy. I wouldn't say they're very shy, but they don't have the skills enough just to to accelerate, you know, the the transformation of uh, their uh, citizen, uh, their digital, uh, their digitalization. 
Of course, we can compare all countries. They are not yet at the same page. In some example, you will see that few countries are just working on it and coming with plan. You have uh, Senegal with their uh, 2025 plan of digitalization supported by uh, Smart Africa. And uh, you have also DRC that have also their own plan, but the entire plan just uh, targeting, they are targeting, you know, infrastructure development to develop services, digitalization of services, and also administration or e-gov by itself. And we're also talking about <coughs> all the cybersecurity issue that also they may encounter. If you take the case of uh, Senegal, they have some prerequisites and uh, also some strategic access. And uh, most of them are just related to legal and institutional, the human capital, the digital adoption, yes, adoption, which is key because if people, they don't trust, nothing will be done. On the uh, access, you have uh, the open access and affordability, but this is also, this remain a huge, huge challenge. And uh, these are some of the points that, uh, that we'll be treating and talking about it. And uh, DRC, they're all quite similar. You may ask, we can ask ourselves, okay, is it not the same plan that people, they just raise the, uh, uh, let's say the title and change the, the country name. Yes, I'm just provoking, but somehow this is how I can, sometimes I can see it because you can see some boldness in how they, they, uh, they accelerate and they, yes, attack the challenges. Of course, we've been talking about competition in all the initiatives, and you will see some of the initiatives are country-wise and are bilateral, but uh, some of them also are corporate. You will see the initiatives of uh, the World Bank, Digital Economy for Africa Initiative. They're all supporting, somehow they're all supporting the, the same objectives. Africa digitalization, yeah, we want infrastructure, we want services and so on, but all of them are just somehow, uh, let's say they are missing boldness and uh, because on the other part, digitalization has to be supported by local actors somehow. And uh, some, actors or some countries think that they will attract international companies just to come and digitalize their, their ecosystem or their communities, but uh, this is not the way it works because anytime we, we launch some friendly challenges and uh, you will see that it's more supported by local entrepreneurs and uh, this is where also we face some of the issues. I will spend more time on these slides because these are the findings uh, for what I've seen for the last five years, you know, supporting entrepreneurship. The first challenge on the infrastructure is today we have unequal access to decent office space because yes, and uh, office space is the challenge when you want to to invest in general, let's say for entrepreneurs in general in, yes, in Africa, whether it's in digital, whether it's in small industries, whether it's an agribusiness, it's a challenge to find decent office space with the utilities that they need, power and water. Today we've been talking about, since we've been talking about digital, there is restricted access to devices when I say devices, I'm talking about computers and also mobile. In some countries, there is a total, there is no tax import, tax for devices, like Senegal, Burkina, and Cote d'Ivoire, if I'm not mistaken. So which means 
it's more affordable to buy a devices, a computer, and all these are supporting, you know, uh, digital literacy. Restricted access for internet access because bandwidth, I think Fabrice talked about it. As long as the pipe is widened, people, they just eat all they can, as much they want, so, but the affordability is there. Are they willing or are they, can they pay for the cost of internet? You will see from one country to another, in DRC, the mega cost $80, where in Burundi, it costs $20. So depending on countries, there are some challenges, I think, to, to, to overcome. Human capital, today there is an inadequate conventional academy and education content in Africa, unfortunately. We've been, if you go and see how education is provided, uh, you will see some IT engineers spending four to five years in university without even getting access to a computer, a laptop, everything is technical. And uh, we have to, to change also the whole content, start dealing with uh, communities challenges, at least they come with yes, solutions. And the low level also of English fluency, the digital literacy, I talk about it, the lack of exposures since uh, knowledge, know-how, gender-wise and so on are still some challenges also. And if I talk about entrepreneurial support, the lack of entrepreneurial skills, the sourcing of valuable project, because let's say that since our entrepreneurs are younger than the, the, the Western side, so of course they are lacking exposure and also skill set enough. The difficult to uh, to access to market because market is sitting with government and they are not open it for for entrepreneurs. On the financial part, most of the time is that the inadequate financing platform for startups because it's missing one part today. Uh, there is not enough financing for seed and pre-seed projects. And uh, on the, let's say globally, the program, what we usually call friendly entrepreneur program, they're unfriendly because it just comes with uh, small uh, duration, three to four months. And I don't think within three to four months, we can become, uh, the, we can build a successful company and uh, the untreatable academic program also business model. Just to conclude on uh, some of the case studies, some of the initiatives that has been also been conducted, Silicon Village and Open Access Data Center, the company I used to head uh, since end of October. So we've been uh, creating a co-working space because we start, you know, bringing solution to so some of the, the issue that we raise because we offering office spaces with also all the mutual services that startups and companies they need. We do include also a data center and uh, a data center, it's a third tier data center, a part of uh, Wyok data center and uh, some of the other initiatives is the PTF, the Park de Technologie Numérique du Sénégal, and Benin, Seme City, which is also, all these are initiatives related to smart cities. Of course, the initiative that we have conducted in DRC, I would say it's a smart center, and the uh, World Bank has uh, supported the initiative by providing 1.6 million USD subsidy because they are coming in DRC with for creating SME center since they have they have discovered that uh, the office spaces is an issue and uh, that's why they've been supporting office center creation and build up just to be able to 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 support the creation of SMEs or startup or small businesses
Thank you very much, Sina. Thank you very much, Raymond, for these uh, very concrete insights uh, from the ground, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there will be more interest, uh, I hope, in the, <laughs> during the Q&A session into the very concrete projects of your last uh, um, slide, also when it comes to the diversity of uh, stakeholders who support these different projects. Um, we will now move, I would say, a bit more from the West and Central African region to East Africa. Um, Andrea Porio, uh, who is our second speaker um, and who is currently a researcher at the African Center for Cities of the University of Cape Town and at the Department of Urban and Regional Studies at the Polytechnic University of Turin. Um, who is going to do the second presentation. Um, Andrea has obtained his PhD in Economic Geography and Urban Studies from the Institute of Culture and Society. Um, so he has done extensive work and published uh, also on um, economic development and urban change in Cape Town, but today he is going to speak about Konsa City, which is a new city project in um, Kenya, and I'm really looking forward in um, to him presenting um, the competition of different stakeholders involved in this uh, project. Uh, I think we will hear about uh, not only China, but also the US and EU having different stakes in this project. Um, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sina, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, as a background, um, just to what Sina already said, um, over the last couple of years, I've been working on a project um, on the influence and impact of, um, let's say, China's digital economy. But the way in which I've been looking at it is through private venture capitalists and private startups that from China operate in East Africa and specifically uh, in Nairobi. So um, I haven't, and unlike many people that focus on the Chinese state and on Chinese state-owned enterprises or like large tech uh, corporations, I've been focusing on a different kind of front of the Chinese expansion uh, in the continent. And the second background that I should give is that I'm, I am an academic and I'll play the part of the academic. I'll tell you a little bit about the story of Konza. Um, hopefully it's interesting enough. I also have some pictures as well, if it isn't. So um, Konza is a new city and for a long time, um, uh, the construction of entirely new, new cities and new towns was a hallmark of kind of post-independence and post kind of post-colonial uh, statecraft, state building in the continent. And a good example is the relocation of um, uh, Nigeria's capital from Lagos to Abuja, which was a move that responded to the vision of an ethnically uh, united and a neutral state, bringing development to a part of the country that was seen as having kind of less, uh, being less advanced economically. And Yamoussoukro and Cote d'Ivoire and Lilongwe in Malawi and other examples kind of followed similar and different uh, trajectories. But today, as you see in the image, uh, new towns, new cities in Africa have not disappeared. And actually, they're one of the, uh, they are an important form of urbanization uh, in the continent. Uh, we can think of New, uh, new Cairo, the new uh, capital city in, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, ASEP, Apollonia City in Ghana, Modern Fontaine, Lansir in South Africa, Akon City in Senegal, if they ever build it, Peninsula City in Sierra Leone, and, and so forth. But unlike uh, kind of post-independence uh, capitals, these new cities, according to their critics, are less about state building and more about creating uh, real estate opportunities, right? real estate speculation. And yes, that's true. And I think they are, these cities are interesting, interesting because they kind of incentivize the shift of kind of domestic African capital from other sectors into real estate markets and construction industries. But they are, they are also interesting, and that's the focus on what I'm going to be talking about today, for how they articulate the relationship between, uh, you know, the, let's say, state building, developmental state building, geopolitics, and specifically the kind of digital ambitions of uh, the African state. And when I say the African state, again, uh, as uh, Folashade earlier reminded us, and also like um, uh, late economist uh, Tandika Mkandawir reminded us, there's no such thing as the African state or as a generic African state, uh, because you know each single state have uh, each single state has developed its own agenda of uh, digital development. And so, in in keeping with that, uh, the focus of my presentation is uh, Konza uh, Technopolis, 
which is a greenfield satellite city currently under construction uh, about 70 kilometers uh, outside of Nairobi. And Kunza is interesting for a number of reasons. One in particular I think really resonates for the conversations that we've been having today is that the first time that the idea of the, sil that the, idea of the silicon savanna was used was actually in reference to Konza in, in the late 2000s, something that I found out by digging into the archive. And so this idea of kind of like a made in Africa innov innovation ecosystem was first used precisely to uh, speak about this new uh, satellite city uh, just outside Nairobi. So around this time, Konza was um, kind of uh, planned and conceived within the National Development Plan that was launched in 2008, Kenya um, Vision 2030. And later on, it was included in a national special plan, and, and then it was gazetted as a special economic zone for the development, uh, for the enhancement of ICT and business process of shoring uh, for Kenya. And after that, that was kind of late 2000s, there was a long period, there was a long, um, there was almost a decade during which the project completely stalled. Uh, owing basically to the difficulty in finding the kind of right financial lever leverages to uh, fund the project and prompting uh, commentators and critics to speak about uh, a failed uh, project or a failed promise and so forth. And I'm not going to downplay all these difficulties, but if you go today to Konza, it's a huge construction site and it, things are forging ahead. Uh, sorry, if things are, are forging ahead, uh, I'm not sure where, but you know, there's, um, uh, there's quite a significant construction site uh, happening uh, at the moment. And so let me get to uh, what I want to uh, kind of like the two stories that I want to um, uh, tell about Konza. The first is that contrary to, or at least in parallel to kind of like understandings of Konza as this kind of uh, project of the government to kind of release real estate values at the out, in the outskirts of Nairobi, Konza should actually be read as an attempt of the Kenyan state to transition from a kind of like more traditional economic, from more traditional economic sectors to advanced digital services. And we see that if we look at the moment and kind of like the history of how Konza became an object of policy, uh, specifically in the late uh, 2000s. So here uh, we need to look at Kenya Vision 2030, the kind of um, the, the, the current ongoing development plan that the nation enshrined into its kind of uh, policy agenda in, in the late 2000s. And within that document, Konza uh, is one of the flagship uh, initiatives which, which are kind of like single projects that are meant to kind of be the bridgeheads of wider ambitions. And specifically, Konza features as uh, within the kind of economic pillar, of course, of the strategy and under the um, one of the six macroeconomic area, areas that were identified in the late 2000s. Now, what's interesting about this kind of like six macroeconomic areas that were uh, singled out in, in, in 2006, 2008, was the fact that four were already the kind of uh, the major um, economic uh, um, sectors for Kenya's GDP. So there were like manufacturing, agriculture, tourism, um, uh, and the other one was retail, right? And two were entirely speculative. So at that point, Kenya had zero to none uh, contribution to its GDP coming from these sectors that were the business persons of shoring sector and uh, finance. So, so CONSA appears specifically in the plan as a project of the business process of shoring sector and, um, and with the idea of kind of concentrating all the digital infrastructural needs that this new industry would need in one specific location that was identified 70 kilometers uh, outside of uh, Nairobi. So in this sense, Kenya Vision 2030 was inspired by the playbook of um, other developing nations, especially um, Southeast Asia. And in fact, um, uh, in, in, um, uh, both Malaysia, uh, sorry, Malaysia, South Korea and Singapore become even benchmarks for the plan kind of delivery uh, and success. And the National Economic and Social Council, which is the body that was uh, kind of formed to advise the government on uh, the definition of the plan, and it was also backed by the, by the donor consultation groups, but so that by the World Bank, actually had even visited Malaysia in, in the mid-2000s and had kind of witnessed what Malaysia was doing to transition from an oil kind of uh, centered economy to a kind of more diversified and service oriented economy. And what Malaysia was doing at the time was building the multimedia super corridor and cyber jaya 
as a kind of smart city that would kind of like ignite the job creation potential of the business process of shoring uh, industry and so forth. In, no, in this context, like the social, uh, the National Economic and Social Council was, was advising the government and at the same time, uh, the ICT ministry was under the helm of an incredibly proactive uh, permanent secretary, uh, secretary uh, Professor Bitangendemo, who kind of pushed the Kipaki government, the government of the time, to put its weight behind a number of other initiatives, initiatives, for example, the switch from satellite communications to undersea cables, which was a, a kind of like a significant geopolitical move because Kenya kind of um, left all these East African partners working on this kind of like satellite and cable project and partnered with a private consortium to actually uh, get access very quickly to uh, undersea uh, uh, to undersea uh, to an undersea cable that would would in, would have kind of decreased connectivity costs and increased uh, broadband capacity. And the same uh, 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 ICT ministry also put its way behind the mobile money uh, project of M-Pesa uh, of the time, right? So as a, as a result, today you have a country like Kenya that has one of the most hard, uh, kind of capillary hardwired broadbands uh, uh, in the continent, the highest, one of the highest mobile penetration rates and the highest mobile money penetration rate. And all of this, just to conclude my first point, is that while Konza sometimes is seen as a kind of like this kind of project of creating uh, real estate opportunities outside of Nairobi, actually in the first place, it was a project of economic transition for the Kenyan state to actually invest in uh, advanced digital services. And that we can see if we also look at GDP data, <clears throat> sorry, and this is just kind of, it's not necessarily evidentiary, but uh, if we look at the last 10 years, uh, uh, the, the growth of ICT services has been around 13%, whereas 13%, whereas the growth of um, um, other sectors as in as I has been around 6%, and even the contribution of ICT towards the, uh, the percentage points of uh, GDP growth overall has been quite significant. Now, the second point that I wanted to make today uh, about this story of um, how CONSA came about is more uh, specifically about geopolitics and the conversation about uh, also about China that we've uh, been having. So again, we need to look at the moment in which CONSA came about as an idea and, um, and also Kenya Vision 2030 uh, as a kind of the overarching plan within which CONSA Technopolis uh, uh, was designed. So in Kenya, journalists talk, journalists talk about uh, this, this kind of like late 2000s as uh, Kibaki's uh, look, east, sorry, look East shift or Look East policy. And it was a time when the, uh, President Kibaki kind of started looking for alternative partners uh, other than uh, traditional kind of Western lenders and donors and, and, and uh, um, foreign investors. And this was not just uh, this was not just China because of, because um, Kibaki looked for partnerships with South Korea, with Japan, and of course also with China. And eventually, this culminated with the signature of a Belt and Road um, uh, Agreement. And of course, today, Ken, sorry, China is uh, Kenya's largest bilateral holder of its foreign debt, although the World Bank is still uh, the largest creditor overall. Um, so going back to Konza, um, even in, the, in this context, at the beginning, it was hard to find for the Treasury if, and for the ICT ministries the kind of right financial partners and right financial leverages to deliver the project. And the reason is what I, what I told you just now is the fact that the, mm, well, on the one hand, it was kind of like a big utopian vision. Uh, so it, it also kind of looked utopian on paper. But on the other hand, it was not a real estate speculation. So traditional investors who were interested in quick money were not interested in investing in, in Konza because the government had a specific priority around de de delivering the tech park before any other kind of investment could happen in Konza. In fact, there was a whole development moratorium all around Konza in terms of the possibility to build as a private, uh, as a private investor in this, uh, in this space and around this space. So, so owing to these difficulties, the, the, the solution to this uh, quandary was to actually parcel, kind of divide up, uh, uh, package this project into single components. Um, and one, a good example of this kind of like dividing, division and, and parceling up of this uh, project is 
uh, Konza's uh, digital infrastructure, uh, of which you see an example uh, in the image. And that's Kenya's national uh, data center, which was financed by a concessional loan from Exim Bank, so from China, built with Huawei equipment. Um, um, and the idea of the data center, of a national data center, is that fundamentally it standardizes and centralizes a number of government databases and cloud services into one single location. But that building uh, that I visited just a couple of days before, it's before it was commissioned, it actually, it's actually a co-location facility that has a, a section for private, uh, for private providers. It has a section for the government. It's locked out from, from the rest of the building that has access to uh, the dark fiber of, owned by the Kenyan government through K, uh, KPLC, so through, the, through, the, through their, the electric network provider. And there is a part dedicated to Huawei Cloud. And Huawei Cloud went live in East Africa before any of its uh, competitors like Amazon or uh, Microsoft. So another piece of the puzzle, uh, and uh, I'll conclude very briefly, is the kind of the smart grid underneath. So the kind of the, um, the whole infrastructural system, the piping system upon which the city will be built. This is also almost done. This was awarded to an Italian contractor financed by uh, 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 an Italian public investment bank. And, and, and the, 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 the loan was securitized through a bond issued by Standard Bank Kenya, which in turn is, in, is owned by Stanbic, which is in turn is owned by uh, a state-owned bank in China in what was one of the largest investment of China and Africa uh, to date. I think the largest actually. Um, in the, the dam that will provide uh, water access, sorry, the dam that will provide electricity access to Konza was financed by the African Development Bank. The upgrading of the highway was provided by the World Bank and by the US. And so you have all these examples of like various geopolitical players that come into this kind of like parceling of, Ponza, uh, of Konza into uh, different kind of infrastructural pieces. And the last example, which I think also is very interesting uh, for discussions about the kind of geopolitics of digital infrastructure, is um, the new university that, is, uh, that was being built at the time, and now it's uh, technically operative, uh, the Kenya Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, which has the same name, and um, it was funded by the South Korean government. It has, it has the same name as the Kenya Advanced, uh, sorry, of the South Korean Advanced Institute for Technology that was created by the US, by USAID, in the 70s to kind of uh, foster and boost the kind of developmental state project in South Korea. And now that institution in South Korea actually exports its curricula to countries that want to kind of accelerate their kind of digital development skills and, and, and produce the kind of uh, engineers and innovators that a new city like Konza uh, will need. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the two stories that I wanted to tell you. Uh, I think I think what's interesting, uh, in my opinion, is both seeing that this kind of like the multi the multipolar set of geopolitical alignments that come into play in one single space like Konza, but also the fact that uh, that a state that a state like Kenya hasn't been just a passive receiver, but actually a very active uh, uh, um, investor in 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 a project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this fantastic presentation. And yes, uh, I would just like to um, continue with this last sentence of your presentation where you say, yeah, Kenya is not just uh, a passive uh, receiver, but um, an active player. And as your presentation shows very well, is that um, new city projects uh, related to digital infrastructure um, projects are still part and parcel of <coughs> state building and of um, yeah, building of a political um, economy. Thank you also for, for all the maps and images, which uh, are sometimes underestimated, but so important to actually understand um, what is happening on the ground. And I'm now turning to um, our last speaker, last but not least, Charlotte Escorn, who is currently undertaking her PhD um, at the French Institute uh, of Geopolitics in Paris 8 University. 
Um, and Charlotte will share with us some insights, I think, into her research on 5G development in uh, West Africa and Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire um, in particular. And yeah, I also very, I'm also very keen um, to understanding how geopolitical uh, plays in West Africa impact um, projects and especially, uh, again, the divide between uh, rural and urban areas, I think, which is also one of your research questions. Um, the floor is yours, Charlotte. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. So my name is Charlotte Escorn. I am a PhD candidate in uh, geography, uh, specialized in geopolitics at the French Institute of uh, Geopolitics of the University Paris 8. So uh, I'm very pleased to be here to talk about my research and uh, I'm very glad that my colleagues speak before me because I will talk a little bit a little bit more about digital transformation in Senegal and its effect uh, on territories and I will also talk uh, about the Damnadio which is quite the equivalent of uh, Kwanzaa city but in Senegal so in West Africa. So my thesis topic is on 5G network in West Africa, in 5G network deployment in West Africa. I am trying to understand how economic competition between Western and Chinese player is struggling the deployment and Chinese presence in the 5G network in this territory, especially in Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire, as Sina said. I am also interested in new dynamics brought about um, brewed by the development of this network in rural, urban, and peripheral uh, areas, um, and how they affect the activities of the various players present uh, in this place and areas. Finally, I look how uh, Senegalese and Ivorian players are using this competition to serve their uh, own interest at national and transnational level. What interested me in working in this topic was the, but the hypothesis that um, how there are many companies and international powers that want to position themselves on this market, this would offer African uh, players new negotiating levers uh, to serve their own interest and those of the populations. My presentation today will therefore attempt to explain how the competition between Western and Chinese players on the digital uh, sector and 5G is shaping China's presence in West Africa. Uh, secondly, how this competition is helping to shape urban and rural development and to develop or not new economic activities, using Senegal as an example. Finally, I look at how the Senegalese government is taking advantage of this competition to serve its political interest and reinforce uh, its territorial control. So, first, it is important to note that there is um, so to note that. The, that in, most um, that in most developing countries, and particularly in African continent, there is a strong association between digital technology, technical progress, and development. High hopes are placed on digital technology to both meet the need of the local population and create new markets. This belief is fueled by a lack of conventional infrastructure, especially in rural areas. In the case of Senegal, 70% of the population lives in Dakar region, and everything is concentrated around this city. Other areas lack like hospitals, schools, and public buildings. So there is a strong uh, emphasis of the government to ask private uh, companies to invest in the dig in digital infrastructure to make this need uh, accessible online. The advantages for the government is that this type of strategy allows uh, it to invest at lower costs than buildings, maintaining and playing staff to ensure access to these services across the country. 
Given that the network is deployed by private companies, the Senegalese government has also invested in the development of network infrastructure to free itself from a unique dependence on private players. This has been made possible by the Smart Senegal project. This partnership between China and the state of Senegal, financed by the China Exim Bank and using Huawei equipment and expertise, has five objectives. The first is to deploy a network infrastructure managed by the Senegalese administration to offer a solution to provide easier access to public services to improve education, security in the city through the installation of video surveillance cameras and facial recognition software, and to offer new data transit routes via an undersea cable between Senegal and Cap Verde Island linked to Brazil. Um, so in this case, the support provided by China and Huawei has enabled the Senegalese government to move away from relying on private operators to use digital technology to fill the gap in certain infrastructure. But this Chinese support and the materialization of this project has its limits and reveals the power struggles between China and Western players on digital issues. So this presentation first will uh, focus on Chinese presence in the telecommunication sector, especially in West Africa. Second, we will try to discuss the impact of Chinese presence on connectivity and smart uh, project in Senegal. And to conclude, um, to finish, we will um, discuss how Senegal government use this competition to serve its own interest and reinforce its control on its territory. So to begin, um, I have made this map. So it, what is interesting to see in this uh, is that uh, countries such as Senegal or Côte d'Ivoire, and even Togo and Benin now, are very strategical uh, countries for to, to, to give connectivity in other countries such as Mali, Burkina Faso, or Niger. The interest of those territories is that they have many undersea uh, cable access, data centers, they have good um, fiber optic cable uh, connection in the country linked to these other uh, territory. Uh, Ghana and Nigeria, also have this um, uh, uh, interest, but there are very few interconnection between at the border from Nigeria to French speaking countries. So that's why Senegal and Ivory Coast are kind of the most important countries if you want to have access to Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. <clears throat> So to talk a little bit more about China's presence in telecommunication sector, so China, which wants to assert its position and uh, in the face of um, American hegemony, is trying to reinforce its ties with developing countries, particularly in African continent. To do this, China is using the advantage um, in innovation and presence of its national company, Huawei. And Chinese interest in African markets are huge. The first reason is the demographic growth of the continent, whose population is expected to double by 2050. Secondly, a large part of Africa is still not connected to internet. Then there is a growing demand for digital solutions from government, especially in Senegal. This is an important market to capture for private players and for foreign government looking to reinforce their diplomatic ties with countries on the continent. The size of these markets implies strong economic and normative power for the company. So unhappy with the growing market share of Chinese companies, the United States used a Chinese ban in 2019 to ban Chinese devices in the United States. Since then, they have been lobbying at the international level, highlighting Huawei risk to data sovereignty and the risk of espionage. 
Through other financial means, they are able to negotiate aid with local actors to ask them to favor Western companies over Chinese ones. These strategies have led to a shift in Chinese presence from East to West, South, and Central Africa. In response, China is offering a number of is offering a number of African government turnkey projects, which, thanks to Chinese support and expertise, should enable uh, these countries to catch up their lagging development and, through digital technology, become driving forces in the global economy. This aim, uh, the aim of these projects is to reinforce local telecommunication infrastructure combined with application or services managed by public players to improve key development sectors such as education, health, security, and territorial control. Chinese presence in Africa through massive investment in transport infrastructure, mining, agriculture, and public networks now extend to investment in the digital sector. It is, particular, it is particularly active in the market for uh, physical internet infrastructure, such as, fi such as fiber optic cable, networks antenna, servers, etc., and the sales of uh, terminals, such as uh, uh, phones, uh, smartphones, and computers. For the moment, the internet operator and internet service provider Business uh, are still dominated by local, uh, non-Chinese public or private companies. In terms of platform, it is mainly North American applications that are still used. But Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE have been selling their technology to private companies um, on the continent since the 90s. What is new is that since the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, followed by the, digi by, by the digital Silk Road in 2015. The Chinese government has entered into a new public-public partnership to sell, to sell its uh, development mode and Chinese equipment. This is about promoting China owns development and saying, wow, that's 20, <laughs> that's 20 years ago. Uh, it was a power country, but today, thanks to, in particular to Huawei, it has become a leading economic power and has beaten American companies in innovation and 5G. So I just have uh, three minutes left, so I will try to be a little bit faster. Um, so second, the impact of Chinese presence on connectivity. In the case of Senegal, it is interesting for several reasons. Um, Huawei has had an interest uh, in increase the number of customers in order to boost its sales. So it is um, selling its equipment both to private operators such as Sonatel Orange, Free, Expresso, and to, to public, pri uh, to public pri players. However, a part of the strat digital strategy of the Senegal has also invested in development of other network infrastructure, the digital uh, Technologic Park, uh, PTN, in Diamniado, um, which is, uh, it is interesting, uh, but so based in, fifth, um, based in the periphery of Dakar, Diamniado is a kind of a showcase that Senegal is trying to promote as an example of its success and emergence. Considered to be the first smart city in Senegal, it is a city that expects to concentrate administration and activities linked to digital technology. Digital um, and digital technology is presented as a new uh, activity that will enable the country's development and integration into the global economy. In fact, this smart city reveals many of the problems that emerging economies can face. The main one is the concentration of, of similar energy intensive activities in the same place. The PTN, which is include which includes a university building house to take uh, for tech companies and another data centers, is just a few meters from a data center inaugurated by Huawei in June 2021. 
The proximity of this data center in the same area means that there is no redundancy uh, in the event of a problem affecting the area, like fire or flooding. And these infrastructure are being added to another area that are already been that have already been equipped by other private operator. For some local telecom experts, this investment is very costly in very costly infrastructure, both financial and in terms of energy, are not enough to are not enough to improve connectivity. In the, um, so, in their view, this infrastructure should be pulled. But because of economic competition and financial interest, it is not the case. So, to really conclude, <laughs> um, China is consequently relying on Huawei's success both to. Oh yeah, so I have many stuff to okay. No. Um, <laughs> both in conquering market and on its innovation to promote China's greatness and power on international scales, with U.S. sanction and the rejection of Chinese equipment by Western powers, Huawei and ZTE, uh, ZTE are relying on long-standing par partners such as. Um, digital uh, economy of emerging power and African countries. This partnership, this partnership takes several forms depending on private private agreements, generally, generally negotiated more firmly on the African side, and public-private partnership. Um, the latter have certain limitations, both in terms of delivery and performance, but they enable African political players to express a message on an international scale of uh, reinforcing and emancipating from private operators, such as Orange or Vodafone, uh, that remain local population of the monopoly of former colonial states, such as France or United, kind or United Kingdom, um, on the continent. On a national scale, this, the rise in the power of public players of digital issues is also enabling political players to reinforce control and surveillance on their territory. In addition, um, the increase to, to increase the network infrastructure in partnership with China, the deployment of digital tools and services, particularly in marginal area, is enabling the state to demonstrate its power uh, in a new way. The example of the Safe City program, which Huawei has sold um, to several major African urban centers, such as Nigeria, um, Côte d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, and Senegal, um, offers tools to government uh, for government to control over its population. So finally, this uh, Huawei uh, global project sold by China uh, is not only selling digit. China is not only uh, selling digital equipment and services; it is also exporting a, a whole way of administration and managing population and preparing new routes for developing other activities linked to, an exp to the exploitation of digital networks and uh, users' data. So China, so to conclude really, uh, China's normative uh, reach in the conquest of African cyberspace is therefore a point that crystallized geopolitical tension between Western players, China and African countries, between new means of negotiation and new dependencies. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, I mean, as a political scientist, I have to say I'm, in, I'm enlightened um, to hear so much about state building. Um, and I'm also very much interested in um, how Diem Nyadio, as a presidential project, um, uh, might be evolving uh, with the next year's election coming up. Um, but maybe let's not go too deep into politics right now. Um, I would like to see if there are any questions in the chat for those who are still with us online. So, yes. Um, if Mathilde or Adis could just read them out for us. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, there is one question in the in the chats. Um, and I'm just going to read it. 
Among the challenges to digital development, what is specific to digital and what is a symptom of the global challenges to entrepreneurship? Will digital be a catalyst to economic development or does it have to follow other developments? Okay, this question was for, sorry, or the general one? Sorry, I think it was quite a general one okay. and um, it arrived quite early on, so I'm sure that a lot of uh, um, elements of answer were already uh, uh, put forward. Fantastic, thank you. And I would like to take uh, one, two or three more questions from the room, as far as there are some. Okay, uh, maybe Fola Shade and Alice then, and I see a third hand behind. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I have a small question for uh, Charlotte, um, making the link with the previous uh, panel as well about um, data sovereignty and uh, the example of Diamniadio uh, data center. Um, I was wondering in uh, your view, what does this um, example of you know, how the center was built, the narrative around it, uh, the political objectives also um, around it. How, what does this say about Senegal's um, position or approach to digital sovereignty and uh, also to the question of digital rights? Thank you. Um, I think I would have two questions. I also have a, a question for uh, Charlotte, but also linking. I know you weren't here for the first panel, um, but um, there was a bit of a conversation that relates a bit to what Fola Shade was saying about uh, data localization and what is in uh, what's uh, what the uh, sorry where is the data located? And I think you said in your presentation that there is no data redundancy uh, that the the data center is local and there is no backup. Uh, earlier, we heard um, uh, Henry say that the data was actually, um, for most of Africa's data centers, the data was in Europe or the US, or at least um, sort of uh, circulating through those zones uh, or through other African countries. And I think we heard from uh, Fabrice as well that uh, the data that was located in Africa is only ca cash data. And so I'm confused. And if anyone can fill me in about where is actually the data, what data are we talking about, what is local, what is uh, circulating through Europe or US, that would be useful. Uh, so anyone could answer, also even Fabrice or Henry, I guess, if you have points on that. Also, I would be interested to hear Raymond, uh, at some point you ended up uh, with these interesting projects for like local innovation hubs and how you've been trying, if you and probably other actors have been trying to develop um, locations where you have uh, uh, digital infrastructure, the the, um, the computing power, the data centers, and some of the skills, training, etc. And linking that to, I think that's something that Sina was hitting at, which is linking that with the international projects that you mentioned, uh, Digital Africa, whatever, things from Google, from Orange. Are those, are those two linked? Like, are the local hubs that you were talking about linked to those international projects? I'd be interested to know, to know that. I think there was another question. Yeah, we'll take one more question and then we'll have a second round. We still have, I mean, if we calculate properly since we started later, we can have another 20 minutes for questions. So at least two more rounds. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Remy Mian. I'm from the uh, Center of uh, International Studies at Sciences Po. Uh, so I just had two quick questions. Uh, one for uh, Dr. Puglia. Uh, so given that the uh, Kanza Technopolis hasn't yet fully lived up to its promise, uh, what development lessons uh, can be drawn uh, by the private and public sector uh, from the successes and the challenges that uh, Kanza has faced? And uh, I also had a question for um, uh, Ms. Eskalm. Uh, in your research, have you uh, seen a noticeable change in Chinese investment in telecommunications in West Africa, uh, given that uh, brick and road investments are down 50% uh, over the past four or five years? And are you concerned that uh, China stepping back from telecommunications investment in the region could um, potentially negatively impact uh, the sustainability of those investments? Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. What I suggest, uh, I will give the floor to Raymond, then Andrea and uh, Charlotte to have the same speaker's order. Thank you. Thank you. 
So uh, just to answer about the global initiatives around entrepreneurship and digital, of course, it's uh, mainly it's supported by uh, global initiatives, which is helping to identify because th the biggest challenge is the sourcing of entrepreneurs. And uh, because so far the way it has been introduced in Africa, it's, it's like, uh, okay, there is not, the employability is less and there is not enough jobs for the youth. So we should help them to enterprise, to create their own business. So all these initiatives just comes as a project just to for young diplomas. And uh, so to source the real entrepreneurs that have some real companies that are working, some valuable projects, this is where the challenge is. And uh, this is why we need to to change, to shape that all the initiative that has been so far supported by all these partners. And uh, from the beginning, yes, it was nice to have, uh, you know, it's, it's some kind of CSR activities for most of the corporate companies, but uh, coming with that uh, business oriented, like open innovations, this is where things are missing because you can't find easily some partners that are investing in kind of open innovation platform. I've seen it so far only with uh, Vinci that have a real open innovation platform where they're interested in the ideas or the project owners. Because most of the time, if the idea is great, they invest in that company if the, the ideas that shown some limits, they can also see how to work with the project owners, whether the, the person is talented or not. Because it's also a way to identify talents to onboard them into companies. Digital transformation won't come from inside. Unfortunately, uh, entrepreneurship, we don't have it in in most of our corporate companies. And if you, if you look at also where it's, it comes from, Africa is, a, is an area where you have more international company sitting there and uh, they won't invest in local initiatives supported by local talents because investments come from the center and this is why government need to play a, a major role on the whole transformation or we, or we should develop our own champions, local champions. And this is where the boldness is required. And uh, if I also, if you just allow me just to, to also say that this is why the incubation and acceleration program that we are offering so far are not enough. That's why today we've been more thinking how to go on build the venture studios or venture building because venture building is, is more tangible uh, because there is a lot of potential in Africa and so far nothing is done, nothing in, is pushed further. And uh, Venture Studio or Venture Builder, it brings not only cash, but it brings also the expertise and the execution where we are most of the time missing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question. I didn't catch your name, um, but I'll get it later. Um, um, what development lessons can we learn? I don't, I don't know if the question is what development can we learn, but I can tell you what I've heard from the people that I've been engaging and what the kind of the development question that they've learned from Konza's kind of like failure or stalled kind of long, long uh, wind, winded kind of um, journey. 
well, the first, the first is the very simple one is that basically separating the real estate, the kind of like the very, uh, ap, ap, you know, the, the very attractive side of the investment from other pieces of the uh, infrastructure in a new city makes everything go very slow, right? But for me, the more interesting side of that story is that, you know, I'm, I'm someone interested in, in uh, bureaucratic systems. I, I'm interested in uh, the way in which bureaucrats uh, and technicians uh, that work for the state see these processes. And my understanding is that they see this as the long game in the same way as they see, for example, the fact that a company like Huawei became um, so fundamental and so successful in Kenya by playing the long game. And by, um, uh, for example, you know, they built a relationship with the Kenyan government and with the Kenyan private sector over, over many, many years. And they got to the point where they are now. So for example, where they uh, facilitated the, 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 um, uh, the migration of uh, M-Pesa data from German servers into, into Kenya in, in two nights and you know, with, without you know, anyone even talking about it in, in, in the newspaper. So building that kind of relationship over so many years. And so for me, the question is um, the, 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 what the, the, learning, what the learning that was gleaned from, uh, for example, from a case like Konza is that it, it's, it's not so much about pragmatism as it is about playing the long game and creating the kind of infrastructural conditions that at some point may or may not uh, uh, play out in, in, in specific ways. And another example I think is super interesting is the fact that at some point, uh, 15 years ago, the Kenyan government kind of decided that um, the uh, network, uh, the electric network operators were also gonna be um, network operators for uh, digital uh, services, right? And that has created a redundancy, right? A dark fiber that exists, and now it's being deployed by very small companies that act as ISPs and work in very marginal areas of the big cities where they have access to this uh, additional broadband and they can uh, deliver very low cost connectivity to people that wouldn't otherwise uh, be, they would not otherwise have the capacity to actually afford data from the network carriers, the kind of the MTN, sorry, the telecom and the Safaricom and so forth. So that's, I think, the way, the way in which some of my kind of informants and interlocutors see the, the kind of the meanings of like long-term projects versus uh, quick and dirty money. Well, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I will be glad to answer. So about the data center in Senegal, in fact, there is many data centers. There is data centers uh, that are owned by uh, the, three, the yeah, three operators, so uh, Sunetel Orange, Free, and Expresso. Those data centers are located, they are, the place where they are located is secret because data centers are critical structure. If people know where is the data center, it can be a danger for the data. But uh, when you look on the maps and when you do some field studies, you can um, recognize where they are. So in Senegal, there is many data centers owned by private companies and they are not uh, in the same place. So there is a redundancy because they are not in the, in the same place. So you have one data center with all the data uh, put inside and you have another one which is a copy. So if this data center fall, uh, you have a copy somewhere else in another territory that can, um, uh, th where there is your data. And this is why OVH, the French uh, um, data center service, has some problem after um, a fire. Um, so what I was talking about is that st the states of Senegal, with the new data center put in, in Dianyado, uh, build with Huawei, and the other ones they are uh, building with the PTN are literally 20 feet uh, meter, uh, tw 20, 20 meter uh, close. So if there is a problem in this territory, it's a problem. But state of Senegal, uh, with the new data centers, they are just uh, inaugurate. In fact, uh, yeah, it was more a marketing uh, or um, yeah, it was more a publicity 
because the states of Senegal already own two data centers uh, that were in Dakar, uh, in the center of Dakar, in Plateau, and another one in the Technopole of Peking, if you know a little bit uh, Dakar. So uh, this one is more kind of a, 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 yeah, a structure to, to, to make the publicity of its, of its own uh, development. And someone tells me, because if you, if you see the picture of this data center, there is a big um, panel, uh, put data center. And someone tells me, uh, if, you, if you made a data center, you don't want that people know that's a data center. So you don't put a big uh, panel saying data center, especially if it's a data center that must be used to a bird, um, to to host, sorry, thank you, <laughs> to host all the public uh, data of the country. Um, and uh, so I, I, I hope that I have uh, answered to your question correctly. Uh, about the data inside the data center, it can be difficult to really know what's inside because you have uh, a data center that hosts uh, private uh, companies' data and public uh, administration data. So you don't know what's inside. And about the cash, uh, it's kind of also a question of the internet exchange point, which uh, there is one in Senegal, a public one. But for the moment, all these internet exchange point already exists, but uh, they are um, managed by the uh, private company and especially by Orange. Um, yeah, so I hope I, 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 I answer well. And about the investment, so it's kind of a tricky question because uh, there is no transparency and it is really difficult for me uh, to have all access to all the investment um, of China in Senegal and in West Africa. So I'm not sure if I understand well your question, but the point is that even if Chinese state is less um, investing in, uh, in digital infrastructure on those territory, Ch um, Huawei and ZTE are still very present. And uh, in fact, the presence of um, equipment, Chinese equipment are not fully linked to the uh, investment of China. So I, I, I'm not sure if I understand well your question, but there is two strategies, the strategies of China and the strategies of the companies. If you want to talk a little bit more about this uh, later, I'm, I'm, open to, <laughs> I'm open to speak. Um, yeah, in a second. Uh, yeah, uh, there will be a cocktail after this uh, last round of question um, that I'm gonna uh, invite you to participate at now. And then also, Raymond, I think you want to yes. maybe very quickly because we have five minutes left and there are a couple of more questions. No, Wait. Very quickly, yeah. just to add on, just to support Charlotte, what she's talking about, about data center, the, the duplicity or the data sovereignty. And uh, for business continuity, companies, they need to have to duplicate their data into several data center. Even in DRC, we have actually, we have small data centers, but the biggest data center will be supported by private company. One is OADC, Open Access Data Center from WIOC, and the other one is from Raxio two big players, data center players in Africa. But data center are less than 10 kilometers, but it's, they will duplicate it for business continuity and you will have most of bankers system and so on. A question has been asked, which kind of data they're requesting. It's they want local data, transaction and so on to be located within the countries. We're talking about final show, and uh, tomorrow it will be health uh, data and so on. These are the data they are looking, you know, to locate it in the country. Just to support the data center or the, uh, the fiber optic in Senegal, since I know the market very well, it has been requested to 
national, uh, let's say, initiatives uh, that has been created by government just to turn it corporate. And we have, it has requested to the fiber optic of the government to start selling it to corporate. So now it's a private, so it's competing with other players, but in bulk, not for retail. Yeah, these are things that I wanted to add. Thank you, Raymond, for um, this added information. So we have five minutes left, uh, not more than 30 seconds per question and one minute for the answers. Sorry for uh, pressuring. So there is uh, Patrick, Diana I, I first. Yes. Diana first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, it's just a quick question and maybe I hope it's not uh, uh, too, uh, too different from what we've been discussing. Actually, it's about energy because uh, some of you mentioned the fact that these are very data centers are very energy intensive, which is clearly uh, true. So I was wondering if in these energy plans, uh, in these digitalization plans that you've been looking at, um, there is an energy component. Um, how is this looked at? Um, and also in the partnerships that are being um, now um, uh, present on the ground around smart cities, is energy uh, a topic? And could the European Union make a difference by um, you know, bringing in this um, sustainable digitalization component? So here in Europe, we talk about double transition, um, green and digital. Is it something that could be appealing for African countries as well? Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, Patrick and then Mathilde. Hello, uh, I'm Patrick Lamson-Hall from the OECD Sahel West Africa Club. And I just want to kind of have a question about like the smart city side of it. I'm curious, given how capital intensive it is to develop smart cities and how they often end up functioning like enclaves, I'm curious if there are any countries that are pursuing alternative models for developing a broad-based um, broad telecommunications industry or digital industry other than this sort of very capital heavy enclave focused smart city model. Thanks, Patrick and Mathilde for um, the last one. Yes, thank you. I had a question stemming from a point that Fola Shade made uh, in, the, in the last panel on the fact that, if I understood correctly, um, the internal political structure of countries also had an impact on the choices of partners and uh, the content of the negotiations that were made. Um, therefore, I was wondering if you had any examples of this in your case studies, uh, Charlotte and Andrea, maybe. Since you mentioned your bureaucratic interest, Andrea, I'm just taking a shot. Thank you. Sure. Um, are there any other questions, like last option? Nope. So, we, uh, Henry, this was a half hand. Okay, one, one quick one. Thank you so much. One just very small technical question for Charlotte and Andrea. I was just curious if um, you were aware of any managed services contracts um, by Huawei engineers uh, on the data centers that they built in terms of maintaining the um, the equipment after the handover and the turnkey of the project. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'll give the floor to Andrea to respond and then Charlotte. I did not catch the second question, but um, um, I wanted to say one very quick one on the, on the energy one. Um, um, I think it is a very interesting question. The cases I know better, so the um, South Africa and, and Kenya, they're quite different, but also quite interesting for this kind of uh, energy data interface, because South Africa is kind of uh, in the process of kind of uh, quite heavily uh, re-regulated, re-regulating its uh, kind of energy uh, providing ecosystem. And what they're doing is they're going to allow data center to become IPPs, independent power producers. Whereas Kenya is interesting for another reason, which is the fact that Kenya produces uh, has a, as an oversupply of green energy, right? Because not because they, there's no need, but because you know the distribution doesn't reach rural counties, so therefore they have more green energy than they need, and therefore it's it's a good kind of selling point for data center companies to be able to say that we're actually just relying on uh, on green energy that is provided to us at subsidized prices because of this reason. I didn't catch the second question, but uh, the one on the data center, what I know um, about the Kenyan case is that um, it was a kind of, um, it was a, a, let's say a Chinese box uh, a agreement whereby 
there was a part of the building that was turnkey, but not the entire building. So part of the building was not a turnkey project, but it was actually you know under contract for one way to be uh, uh, managed and ran and run, and 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 that's where the uh, Huawei's cloud is going to be um, located. One of the facilities in which it's going to be located, but then there is kind of like a side of the building that is that was turnkey. Okay, shout out. You have the final words. So the question about energy is really important and interesting because without energy, internet and digital infrastructure are not working. So it can be the object of another big presentation because there is many cases and uh, every territory has its own specialty. But to be very quick, uh, to, to say it very quick, um, some data centers in, uh, in, the, in Dakar and in Abidjan uh, have the uh, authorization to have their own power station in case of energy cuts, because uh, as you said, um, and as I didn't mention, those territories, um, especially Senegal and uh, Ivory uh, Côte d'Ivoire, um, doesn't have enough uh, energy uh, to fulfill the needs of the population. So there is still huge energy cuts. So um, data center must have their backup solution in terms of energy. But this is, in, this is them that uh, deal with it. But we can talk a little bit more after if you want. Uh, about the partnership, so I didn't really understand the question, uh, Mathilde. Uh, about the Senegal, they are negotiating with uh, kind of everybody. Um, it was a starting point of my research because I was thinking that because there is many interest on those uh, sector and in this territory, it will allow them to have better uh, levels to negotiate it. But in fact, they are just negotiating with everybody and not really uh, thinking about the um, um, way it is, uh, um, how to say it, um, on the way to you know uh, have the benefits of every partnership so there is kind of an addition of many projects on the same territory that are not thinking together and that are kind of not really well working together uh, and about maintaining uh, maintaining the data uh, what what is the question uh, Ah, yes. Uh, yes, so this is the interesting point. So they uh, just uh, give the data center. I think it was a gift uh, from Huawei to uh, the states of Senegal, but they didn't give to Senegalese uh, engineer um, the uh, formation to know how to use it. So which is interesting is that everything is in Chinese inside the data center. So if you don't know how to speak Chinese, you can't use it. And um, <laughs> it's not really funny. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they didn't give the technical um, formation to know how to use it. So it's kind of really difficult. Uh, but the interest for, for China and Huawei is that uh, Senegal needs to continue to use Chinese uh, engineer to maintain the, the data center. But it's just this case, it's just the case in this data center. I didn't visit other ones. This is one of the other ones that I, this is one of the only ones that I uh, had access. Thank you, Charlotte, for this very concrete info also from the ground. I would suggest that we close the session because we're already a bit late. Um, there is a cocktail with some food for those who are here, not for the ones online, of course, very sorry for that, um, waiting for us. So please don't hesitate um, to continue talking about these very passionate uh, issues. Thanks a lot again for all the speakers of both panels for coming to Paris um, and sharing the knowledge and for the whole EFRI team um, for having made this possible. And have a nice evening for all those who are online. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Sina.